All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Spotlight Series highlighting our civil and environmental engineering program. Today we have Professor Lucio Soibelman, who I'm very excited to have with us today to share information about all of our exciting programs within the civil and environmental engineering department. My name is Erin Tanaka, and I represent the Viterbi Admission and Student Engagement Office within the Viterbi School of Engineering. And I'm also joined today by my colleague, Megan Balding, who is online to assist with any questions that come in. Um, during the session, we do encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A panel, and um, we will also um, just quickly go over that process next. So just some quick notes. So for those of you that are attending the session live at this time, you will receive a copy of today's presentation within a few business days. So you will receive a follow-up email and it will have a link to the presentation. So there are some links, especially towards the end of the session. So no need to jot those links down unless you need them right away. In addition, as I mentioned before, please use the Q&A panel to um, ask any questions throughout the session. If they are pertaining to the full audience, then we will be able to answer those during the Q&A session with Professor Soibelman. And then also, if there are any questions that are a little bit more personalized, then, then Megan will be able to, um, and I will be able to assist you with those um, either during or after the, the session. So for today's program, I will start out by talking a little bit about the University of Southern California, or USC, of course. I'll then talk about the Viterbi School of Engineering and give an overview of um, the programs that we have. Uh, we all, but then, of course, we will focus, um, today's session is really focused in on our civil and environmental engineering programs um, that Professor Sorbelman will be able to discuss with you all today. He'll go over some of the, the different the program offerings, um, and then I will also um, talk about application criteria, as well as Dennett Viterbi, which is our online delivery method. I'll also briefly mention our tuition and fees, and then also um, at the end of the session, you will have the opportunity to ask any of your questions, and uh, Professor Soberman and I will be able to answer those at, the, at that time. So for those of you that may not have been to USC's campus or haven't seen uh, our beautiful campus out in uh, Southern California, just some quick snapshots around campus. And a little bit about the University of Southern California. So we are the oldest private university in the Western United States. We were founded way back in 1880. And currently we have over 47,000 students. Our graduate students actually outnumbering our undergrads at over 27,000 students. We have over 4,400 full-time faculty members, uh, which does not include many of our adjunct faculty that um, often come from a variety of different industries and really bring the expertise to the classroom. We have a very diverse student population as well. So we have students from all over the country, all over the world, um, in many different states and walks of life. And we are located in Los Angeles. So I know that many of you are located throughout the world. And so, you know, in terms of our location within California, we're in Southern California. We are about a 10 to 15 minute drive from the Los Angeles area. And we also are about a 40, 45 minute drive, depending on traffic, from the Silicon Beach area. And so really that allows us to have fantastic partnerships with a variety of different companies and organizations that really are looking to hire a number of our engineering and computer science students. Um, but as a whole, USC has fantastic partnerships uh, throughout the world. So a little bit about the Viterbi School specifically. So the Viterbi School of Engineering is one of the largest and oldest schools within USC. We are comprised of eight academic departments and our student population is, you know, as you see there, the, our graduate student population at almost 6,200 students really far outnumbers our undergraduate population. And so they really are a, a central part of our school. Um, somewhat related to our graduate student population is the research that we are conducting. So we are a leader in funded research. I'll talk more about the research in a bit. Uh, but, you know, many of our PhD students are currently working um, within those, those research centers. Um, and we also do have some um, of our master's students that conduct directed research. 
Um, in addition, we have um, 191 tenure track faculty members, of course, one of which being our, you know, Professor Soywoman here. And I, so I won't be talking about all of the different awards, but I'll, I will be highlighting, uh, you know, Professor Soywoman. And, uh, but in terms of our faculty as a whole, we have 30 National Academy of Engineering members. Uh, we also have 70 National Science Foundation Career National and Presidential Young Investigator awardees as well. So from time to time, we do get asked the question, you know, what are you ranked? And so we are proud of the fact that we have been consistently ranked a top uh, 10 ranked graduate engineering program. And then specifically in the online arena, we have been ranked the number one online graduate computer science program for the eighth year in a row. Uh, we've also, uh, for many years, have been a top ranked online graduate engineering program that spans all 40 programs. And it does, of course, include all of our civil and environmental engineering programs um, offered online. In addition, um, for those of you that may be active duty military and veterans, um, this may be of interest to you, but we are also ranked number one for our online graduate computer science program for veterans, as well as a top ranked online graduate engineering program for veterans. Again being all, uh, over 40 programs that we offer completely online. So some key points of distinction that we also like to mention. So, you know, in addition to have students from all over the world, and we do have a number of partnerships in uh, with government organizations and corporations throughout the world. And so really what that means to you as a USC, as a potential USC student in the future, is that when you graduate from USC and specifically the Viterbi School, you really are, um, your degree is really recognized not only here in the US, but throughout the world. So no matter where life takes you, your degree has value. In addition, the Trojan Family Network is something that's very special and unique about USC, but, you know, including, that includes our Viterbi Engineering um, alumni, over 77,000 who um, span all across the world, and time and time again, you know, our, our Trojans are helping out one another um, and, and really providing the networking opportunities that really are a huge benefit to going to USC. In addition, we have a number of program offerings, everything from our bachelor's up to our PhD programs. We do also offer graduate certificates short courses and custom programs. So our short courses and custom programs are um, separate through the, exec through the executive education suite of offerings. And so these are non-degree offerings that we provide throughout um, the year. And But today, of course, we're going to really highlight and focus on our master's degree programs, specifically within civil environmental engineering. So in terms of our research, you know, we are a leader in research uh, funded, uh, leader in funded research, as I mentioned earlier. And so we have research in a very diverse range of areas, um, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence or AI to photonics or sensor networks. Um, so we have a variety of research centers, over 35 research centers currently. Um, and you can see just some great examples there many of which come stem from industrial partnerships and collaboration. And so um, if you are interested in learning more about the various research opportunities um, and what we are doing at any given moment, we do encourage you to go to the Viterbi School website at viterbischool.usc.edu. There's actually a research function, a search function where you can search for various areas of research if you're interested in learning more. But now I would like to introduce you to um, Professor Lucio Soibelman, who I'm very excited to have with us today. Um, so Dr. Soibelman is a Fred Champion Estate Chair Professor in Engineering, as well as um, the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department Chair. He earned his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, as most people know. It's, um, his research areas span a variety of different areas, including artificial intelligence, um, data mining, text mining, machine learning, so many of the very exciting um, different research areas that many um, students are looking, and I'm sure some of you are looking to engage in. So with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Seibelman. He will be discussing our civil and environmental engineering program. Uh, one thing to note is that, you know, for those of you especially that are watching the recording of this um, in the future, uh, please note that the information is, um, is valid as of today, uh, November 6th. 
However, if you're watching this later on, just always make sure that you are consulting the USC course catalog for the most um, up-to-date information. All right, so with that being said, uh, Professor Soimel, if you'd like to, to share your information. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, it's, uh, as said, that's very, very important to know things that change. So, uh, so if you're watching a video, contact us because uh, we are always trying to bring uh, new ideas, new programs. Uh, uh, so, for example, this advanced design and construction technology, it's a brand new program. So you're always trying to uh, avoid that our graduates get to be obsolete. So your, your uh, knowledge is changing fast and our programs are adapting extremely, extremely fast. Uh, uh, the master's program, the large majority, it's a professional program. So, uh, so, uh, uh, we use a lot uh, of support from industry. Uh, we have a lot of part-time lecturers that come and, and bring the, the idea of what is going on in the industry, and they stop by and they teach. They drive from downtown, come to the campus and teach. But at the same time, you have the uh, full-time uh, research faculty uh, part of those programs. So what you are trying to make uh, the strongest point in this in our program is that uh, people learn what it's being done and how industry works, but at the same time they learn in which direction the industry is going to be moving, and uh, they are ex uh, 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 exposed to the new research and things that we are doing through classrooms or even if the students, as I said before, want to participate in research, there are op opportunities for that. So. We have obviously a master's in uh, generic in civil engineering. That it's a it's a broad uh, master's that uh, is exposes the students to a little bit of everything in civil engineering. We have this new master's in advanced design and construction technology. We have a strong belief that uh, robotics, 3D printing. Uh, uh, AI, machine learning, and that's, as I said, that's uh, said before, it's my area of research. It's going to start having a huge impact in this industry. So uh, we created this master's that goes from BIM, from modeling, all the way to uh, prefabrication, automation, and everything that is happening new in, 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 uh, in construction. The interesting thing about this, this master's and this program is that we started, we say, okay, let's see what happens. Let's see if you have interest. And uh, we were overwhelmed by the interest, both from, uh, from the students that uh, uh, registered in the first uh, class for the program. But other thing that was really a shock for us is that industry, uh, this was uh, in the news about this new program. So we start receiving calls from every construction company in the country that they want to be part of this, that they need to hire our students as, as the agents of changes in their companies, that this is an area that they really don't know how to handle, they really need help. So you are even transforming this master's program into a, a membership for industry uh, to have a forum to discuss the future of this industry. So uh, with uh, membership for both construction companies, but for uh, uh, developers of the systems that are uh, uh, going to run this new industry, like the robotics, the virtual reality people, that they really want to interact and understand what's the direction for this, this uh, industry. So uh, in the last bullet, you see that it's the program that you have for many, many years. It's the Masters in Construction Management. This is one of our strongest and uh, with largest number of students. This uh, is a master's of, of uh, uh, where students learn scheduling, estimating. Uh, as I said before, this heavily done by people from industry that it's been doing this for many, many years. The interesting thing now that we have those two programs, the advanced design and construction and the masters. So these students that come for the masters in construction management are allowed to take classes in the advanced design and construction technology and vice versa. So these students are very 
welcome and free to mix and match to find their best, uh, uh, the best package that would work better for them. We have a master's in the structural engineering. Uh, as uh, as uh, we have a lot of faculty in uh, in the program that are in the structural engineering, but again, this is a very hybrid program. The director of the program uh, was the owner of the largest structural engineering company in LA. He uh, sold his shares in the company and moved to be a full-time faculty. You know, we call professors of practice. So he brings really the practice together with other people from industry, and then you have the the academics, the, the, the people that are doing research. We have very strong research in uh, extreme events, uh, earthquake engineering. We have a lot of people looking at what we call health monitoring, understanding the uh, behavior of those uh, of structures during extreme events. And this is an area that we are hiring uh, we just built a brand new structures lab in the department, and uh, this semester, even with the higher freeze, I was allowed by the provost to hire two younger faculty to, to increase our output in research in this area. Transportation engineering, it's a very fun program because uh, uh, it is hosted in civil engineering, but it's all over the university. So you have uh, uh, a Price uh, School, that School of Policy, uh, that has Metrons and other uh, labs related to transportation engineering that are part of our master's program, and uh, the faculty from systems engineering within uh, the School of Engineering. So uh, the students have a huge opportunity here to see from the engineering side to the policy side, and uh, it's a very, very strong program, again, with academics, people from industry, from Caltrans, from the port of LA, from the uh, LAX airport, uh, people that are coming and teaching and bringing the practical experience together with theoretical coming from, a, from, a, from, a, uh, from the professors here. So you have those two masters in uh, transportation engineering and transportation systems, when it's much more uh, related to, to more engineering, the other more policy. So, uh, so again, it's very easy for you guys to see the difference when you go online and you look at the information like that. Uh, you have the masters in civil engineering in water and waste management. Uh, this is much more talking about the vessels, about uh, 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 how to to uh, not the water itself, but how you transport the water, how you deal with waste management. It's more the civil engineering side. And then you have the masters in environmental engineering. Environmental engineering, we did hire a large number, eight, around seven to eight new faculty. And you have very, very strong group now looking the interface of water uh, membranes, desalination, water chemistry, microbiology, so very strong in the water area. And at the same time, you are very, very strong in the air quality area, you have very strong group of professors looking at air pollution, air pollution impact on health. Uh, we have a good lab, fantastic lab for the water and, and air research. Uh, uh, we have uh, 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 interrelated to that, you have a, a subsurface water people that are more in the engineering, uh, understanding plume contamination. We have very strong research in interface of air pollution, global warming, uh, heat islands in cities, and water energy nexus. Uh, so into the sustainability area, very, very strong group of people teaching and doing research in this area. Uh, then there is the third flavor of the transportation that uh, the systems management. And the interesting thing about those flavors, it's many times the students don't even have to decide when they start. They, they, they enter in one, but then according to what they decide to do, they can move from one to another. If they want to go more to the engineering side, more to the policy side, more to the optimization side. So, uh, and then there is a certificate in transportation systems too. 
So uh, uh, there are a lot of things being offered, and uh, uh, and uh, we are working very very hard to make uh, things even better. Uh, so uh, uh, now going to the description. So I think that this we can go faster because this is all available online. But you have uh, uh, the, for example, the generic one that you call the MS and civil engineering. Uh, you can focus in. Uh, uh, engineering water resource, in, in construction, transportation, in geotechnical engineering, in structural engineering. So again, uh, it's more generic, but you still can find uh, majors, uh, almost like a major and a minor, while the others are specific, so would be like a major, and the, this one that it's more broad and allows you to go beyond. This is, there are some employers that require when people are doing, come from industry and during the masters, they tell, uh, what are the classes and the focus that their employer uh, employee needs to focus? So uh, basically, we we allow people to customize their program. This is where they are more allowed to customize their their programs. Uh, and then you have some special concentration and collaboration with other schools within or downside, for example, in uh, geographic information sciences and public works, people that want to work with GIS and other things. And I have an appointment as a faculty at downside in this program of, uh, of geographic information sciences. So, uh, so you have the minimum units, but uh, uh, you can the 28 units. Uh, 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 and again, uh, as I said before, very little of our masters have a core that people are really, really forced to take. There is a, a very uh, a small core and then allows people to go mix and match and take classes in different places. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is the, the advanced design and construction technology. I talked about this. This is the one that you have a bigger core because uh, there are so many things that you want our students to learn that it's changing the industry. So it's uh, BEAM, it's data management, is uh, 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 introduction to computing, uh, advanced technologies, uh, robotics, and other things. Uh, and then thinking about this, and, and and using technology to enable the change in our industry. Uh, uh, this is, as I said before, really, really catching up much faster than you expected. Okay. Next. So uh, structural engineering, uh, so the core again, is uh, me uh, mechanics of solids, engineering mathematical models, Finite element analysis, advanced reinforced concrete, or advanced steel structures and dynamics of structures. And then you have several electives uh, uh, that uh, students can take within the department and outside the department. Next. Uh, so now it starts all the change, the different uh, flavors of the transportation engineering. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and, and as I said before, this is a, a possibility of mix and match. And the advisor for the transportation program, Professor Jim Moore, it's really someone that uh, it, it, when the students arrive, they basically discuss about what are their dream jobs. And then uh, Jim goes with the students and almost customized because you have so many offerings related to transportation within engineering and, and other schools that he's really able to customize the programs uh, uh, with the students. So he leaves it extremely uh, uh, flexible. So you see the description are advising on individual basis to meet with the program director every semester and options how to finalize the plan. So it's the one, I say that it's the most open and this is why I have all those flavors. So uh, uh, specialized transportation courses are offered by the department, but students have additional options in, in units like Marshall School of Business Prices, School of Public Policy, Dornside College, uh, the uh, uh, systems engineering department. So this is basically what I said before. It's an extremely flexible program with a lot of offerings. Next. Uh, so the transportation systems, it's a little bit more uh, structured. 
So uh, students have to take those uh, units that are required. So 17 of the 27 units are, are required. So they have the principles of transportation engineering, construction practices related to transportation, introduction to transportation planning law, methods and modeling tools for transportation planning, and sustainable infrastructure systems. So those are the core and then they, they, they have another 10 units that they can, or more, because this is the minimum to graduate, the 27 units. Next. Uh, so again, uh, uh, water and waste management, it's one of those uh, more uh, uh, generic programs that allow the students uh, to go and find a lot of interesting things that the university offer. Uh, so again, you have an advisor that works and uh, and uh, you have some units of required courses, but uh, uh, a lot of flexibility how to move around. Next. So environmental engineering, it's a little bit more structured, as I said before, you have the focus either in water or, 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 or air. Okay, so uh, so the core uh, is related to air or water concentration, and uh, then you have the electives approved by the department, uh, and all the majority has to be taken at the graduate level of 500. So the students still can take some uh, advanced undergraduate course if they come with not the background to to, to needed to, to to succeed in the program. So uh, the other, the systems management, transportation systems management had another required courses. Uh, so sustainable infrastructure systems, systems engineering theory, construction practices, statistics for engineer management, concepts, concepts of spatial thinking. And then uh, 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 there are the, any three of the following. So what, what you are seeing in those programs is that you have for every area transportation you have one option that the students really can customize everything if they don't feel uh, comfortable, if they feel that they would feel uh, would feel lost, if they would have all the options, we have at the same time programs that are more structured that the student has to take a sequence of classes. Next. And then uh, the construction management that uh, construction practices, construction business, construction planning and pre-construction project controls. So this is the core. And so students can take this core in construction management that, that then take the other electives in the constru and advanced construction uh, program that you just uh, created or vice versa. So, so students can take hybrid. And a lot of students start in one and move to the other one when they realize that uh, there is better options for them in the other program. Next. So, uh, so uh, uh, wrapping up about the department. So I think that you are coming back to talk about uh, applying and enrollment options. So let me just wrap up uh, about the department. Uh, the department is uh, uh, a department that is changing very, very fast. I've been the chair now for nine years. Uh, when I came as a chair, we had uh, uh, 16 professors in the department. I was able to hire in the last uh, nine years, 14 new professors, basically doubling the size of the department. Huge investments. But what we did in research-wise, we decided not to spread ourselves thin because even doubling, we are still a, a small uh, a civil environmental engineering department. Now with the hires and some retirement, so uh, we are stable now in 26 uh, professors, uh, but I'm still hiring two this year. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, research-wise, the department is very strong in four areas. This is where you focus ourselves. We have uh, the extreme events group. We have outstanding research in tsunamis, outstanding research in earthquake and structural engineering. Uh, uh, and even uh, within the, the people that work with construction, have a lot of research looking into designing for extreme events. 
and building for extreme event. So uh, the second area is water, drinking water, uh, uh, waste water, and dealing with water is extremely relevant to Southern California. Uh, the third group is the sustainability group, where you have the air quality people, but again, construction people looking into into uh, uh, green buildings, uh, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, you have the people in water energy nexus. You have the people looking to global warming, uh, 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 heat islands, urban planning, and those areas that you have strong research. And the last area of research that you have that's very strong, it's one that, what you say, that breaks the silos. Uh, civil and environmental engineering has, fall, uh, has been dividing itself by silos for the last 100 years. What I mean by that, you got so specialized in transportation, in construction, in hydro, and uh, you have people in, uh, uh, understanding just part of the engineering. If you think, for example, in a mega city like Los Angeles, okay, you have the people designing the transportation network, deciding the highways, the streets, and optimizing it as if it was an independent system. Then you have the people in the water designing the water distribution systems, the water mains, the pipe systems, and everything as if it was independent. This is because of the silos. But now when you have a water main break, you flood the highway, and both systems stop working at the same time. So there is a lot of interest of understanding the complexity of those systems and the interface that they work. And uh, we have a very strong group of people looking into transportation related to interaction with other systems, uh, 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 resilience, infrastructure resilience, and all those types of, of of research. So that, this is what we bring from the research-wise that in the end permeates to the programs that you teach even at the master's that, as I said before, is a professional master's. But on the other hand, we know that practical experience is extremely important when you have a professional program. So we do have a very nice balance of people from industry with people from academia, as I said before, I think that our strength is to teach what it's needed for you to succeed and to get a job and to do a good job today, but at the same time that you're prepared to the future and won't be obsolete in five, 10 years. So that's the small introduction to the department. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. It's very easy to find me. Uh, just go to the homepage of the department, look for the chair, and, 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 and uh, you're going to find my name and all information about me. So, back right. to you. Thank you so <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Sobin. That was very, very informative. And um, all of you, again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A panel to ask questions. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end, of the, at the end. So, um, and we will get to that shortly. So. Feel free to ask your questions away. But now again, as a, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the application process and enrollment options for those that are hopefully looking to apply. Uh, keep in mind that this information is relevant or is accurate as of today, November 6th, but if you're watching this later on, just please always make sure that you are referring to the prospective graduate student website that has the latest information. So in terms of the application criteria for our master's degree program, um, an undergraduate degree in engineering, math, or arts science from a regionally accredited university is required. So you would need to initially submit copies of your official transcripts during the application process. Um, one thing to note is that the master's of construction management program, as well as the master's in uh, master's science in transportation systems management, will is a little bit more flexible in terms of the undergraduate degree you have. So you don't necessarily have to have just an engineering, math, or science background. It's a, a more open to those with a variety of different backgrounds as well. And the, but to be competitive, although it's not required, we do recommend a 3.0 on a 4.0 scale from a regionally accredited university. However, if you don't have a 3.0 or above, we do encourage you to strengthen your application in other various ways that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, in terms of the GRE, we did have a recent update. So this update is of, uh, as of 
September 30th it started, but due to the challenges that we're currently facing with the pandemic, we are um, not requiring, so the USC Viterbi School is not requiring the GRE exam for the spring, summer, and fall 2021 applications to any of our Viterbi graduate engineering programs. However, if you're watching this after that application cycle, um, you will want to make sure that you conduct or um, to refer to the, um, the, the graduate student pub, uh, prospective student uh, website for more information. In addition, a resume or CV is required that would be needed to up, be uploaded through the application system as well as a personal statement. A letter of recommendation, it will, uh, that's the thing that will make the most, um, or it will be different depending on the individual program. So some programs, it'll be optional. So, you know, you're welcome to submit them if you feel that that would help supplement your application. Otherwise, um, you know, you don't have to, um, but sometimes there can be up to three letters of recommendation required. In addition, for those that um, international applicants, this may apply, may or may not apply to you, but it's the TOEFL um, English proficiency exam may also be required. But again, we do encourage you to consult the individual program page for information about the individual degrees that you're looking um, to apply for. In terms of the application deadline, so we had our spring 2021 deadline that has recently passed. Um, there is an asterisk there that if you are planning to pursue your program completely online via Denevaturby, you can reach out to Megan and I at denevaturby.usc.edu to see if you um, would be able to receive an application extension, and that that is for you know any of the um, upcoming terms. However, if you are planning to apply. Um, if you're planning to pursue your program on USC's campus, of course, once it's, it's back open, um, then we do encourage you to um, apply for the fall 2021 semester. Um, of course, everyone is welcome to apply, both online and on campus. Um, the deadline for scholarship consideration, and this is for on-campus um, applicants only, is going to be December 15th. And then for everyone else, um, the, the final application deadline is January 15th. Um, and in addition, the spring 2022 semester, you can see the deadlines um, as well there. So you do have a couple of course delivery options. So you do, of course, have your on-campus option, uh, many of which our students are, are pursuing a program full-time on USC's campus. Um, of course, you know, you are you know, welcome to take, you know, two to three courses per semester, um, sometimes even more, but, you know, on average, our students are taking, taking about one and a half to two years to complete their degree as, as full-time students, um, whereas for our online um, Den of Viterbi students, they tend to take one or two classes per semester because they, the large majority are working full-time, so that works with their schedules. And so on average, our, our denovatory students are graduating about two and a half to three years. Um, but you know, as long as you uh, complete your degree within five years with the ability to petition for an additional two years, and then um, it is flexible and many of our denovatory online students um, do use additional time. So a little bit about how our online Denevaturby delivery method works. Uh, we know there's a lot of online different offerings, especially during this current pandemic, but, you know, we do want to distinguish, distinguish the fact that, you know, we are a proprietary web-based delivery system. So Denevaturby has been around for many, many years, um, but we also had the distance education uh, ex expertise well back into the 1970s, 1972 to be exact, when we had old school video recordings. But now we are, have over 40 programs that are offered completely online. And the way that it works is that you can watch the lectures in one of, of three ways. So you can watch the lectures live as they're happening on a normal basis on USC's campus. The great thing about that is that you would be able to call in during your live lectures and ask your questions. You could also chat or use the uh, panel to um, ask your questions during the session. Um, but recognizing that not everyone can attend the live session, so we also have each of our lectures are recorded and then they are available in the course recording archive that is available to our students after the lecture until the end of the semester. So it's a great setting tool. You could use it also, of course, to watch lectures for the first time. Um, and um, it's just a very flexible, flexible way of watching the lectures. In addition, um, you 
can, once uh, USC's campus is back open safely, you are able to come to campus, you are able to sit in on lectures, um, because you are in the same classes as the on-campus students as well. Um, some other things to note, so in terms of your exams um, and homework assignments, those are both the same, again, because it's the same exact program. Uh, but as, in, in terms of exams, our students um, that are located in the Los Angeles, Orange, or Ventura counties would, on a normal basis, take their exams on USC's campus. Um, if you're outside of that area, there's a variety of different locations that our students have taken their exam at, and we have a dedicated exam coordinator that works with our students to, um, to assist them with, you know, um, determining which location that is most convenient for them to take their exam. So it's a very, um, you know, convenient process for them. This just gives you an idea of the behind the scenes look at a Den of Viterbi typical classroom. So this is the vantage point of a, a camera operator. So that is connected to our network control team. And it's an entire team of support that really is there for our online Den of Viterbi students so that they can hear and see everything that's going on um, in the classroom at any given point. And if there's any ever technical issues, they're there for, to support them as well. So some additional information. So um, in addition to being able to apply for formal admission, we also have what's called the limited status option, which enables qualified students that have um, an undergraduate degree in engineering, math, or a related field from a regionally accredited institution with a 3.0 GPA or above to take classes before um, applying for formal admission. So it's a great way to get a jump start in taking courses before the full application process. Um, but it's limited in the sense that there's a maximum of 12 units you can take. and um, and, you know, you are not guaranteed that you would be formally admitted into a degree program. So you still have to formally apply for a degree program, and, um, and it's not guaranteed. However, if you later on apply for formal admission and are admitted, then the courses that you took as limited status toward a particular degree program, as long as they are, you know, required courses, then those would be applied to the master's degree program that or, or graduate degree program that you um, are admitted into hopefully later on. Um, so to get started, we do encourage you to, to visit the link there for more information. And again, you will receive a copy of today's presentation within a few business days for those of you that are online with us currently right now. Um, in addition, we do have an employer reimbursement deferment um, option, and this is for those whose companies may pay their um, a tuition reimbursement. Um, and so they can defer their upfront payment until after the semester is over, up to 90% of their tuition. So it's a, it's a um, convenient uh, thing for some of our um, Den of Viterbi working professional students as well. But we do encourage you to, to go to the website for more information about those. And this just is a tuition structure for our current um, per unit cost. Um, so the, the per unit cost is the same whether you're online or on campus. Um, there's some additional per semester fees that you'll want to take into consideration. So we do encourage you to visit our tuition and fees page for more details about that. And to get started, so many of you, I'm sure, have already visited our website, which is great. Um, so there are a number of different other events that we have coming up, lots of virtual events, um, as we know that that's just the way everything's working right now. So we do encourage you, um, for those of you uh, as well that are wanting to pursue their program on campus and would normally want to visit campus, you, there's a number of alternatives um, right now that you can find on our website at the link provided there. Also, of course, to start your application and um, the process for applying. Um, for those of you that are planning to pursue your program online via Den of Turby, we do encourage you also to start your application for formal admission of the link provided there. Um, also, if you are wanting to get started as a limited status student as early as spring 2021, which starts in January, um, so just not too far away, we do encourage you to complete your Den of Turby profile if you believe you're qualified at the link provided there to find out whether or not you are approved. Okay, so now we have the opportunity to answer some of the questions from the audience. So I'm gonna go through the questions um, here real quick. And um, so the first one is, I was wondering if master's students are able to pursue graduate research in the Viterbi School of Engineering. 
Okay, so uh, yes, uh, normally the way that uh, I and this is very uh, specific for each professor. Okay, and the way that I work, I have my research team. I have around five to six PhD students. So when master students want to do research, I invite them to attend my my weekly meeting with my PhD students. I have what I call my research team weekly meeting. So uh, those master students uh, uh, basically start seeing everything that my PhD students are doing, and then I try to match the master students to a PhD student. The idea is that not to spread myself too thin of having 30 different topics of research that I would have difficulty uh, catching up and, and work with all those different areas. I try to concentrate and then basically those uh, master students start uh, working and bringing uh, tasks that they work with the PhD students, uh, writing papers, uh, doing bibliographical research, doing data acquisition, developing a small uh, software that needs for the testing and the validation. So we find out the, uh, the expertise in the background of the master student, uh, allow the student to learn a little bit about what research is about. But my objective is that this master student in the future would join a PhD program. So my objective is to introduce research to this master student. Uh, majority of the time, we don't have funding in this situation. This is much more a voluntary work that the, student, the master students do. Uh, but there are some, uh, sometimes some funding available. Great, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, so another question we get is just, um, from uh, students is, you know, what are our do the um, the Turby alumni do um, within the civil environmental engineering department? Um, so maybe some examples of companies they work for um, or different career op opportunities. So that's uh, that's all over. Uh, we uh, we uh, when you work in such a broad areas in engineering like transportation, like so. Uh, so I would say that we have, uh, because you are in a big city, because you have a lot of people from industry teaching, because our students, normally people that move to California as a student tend not to move out of California ever again. <laughs> so, so we have a large number of alumni living around and getting jobs here, so they, uh, uh, and they want to participate and be part of the the, the 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 program. So we have, for example, an example in construction. We have students that are a member of the CMAA, Construction Management Association of America, that they compete uh, nationally in the national competition. So we have all people from industry. We have six or seven teams from our department competing the national competition. All of them are are mentored and trained by people from industry. So we are very near downtown LA, so they are around here. So in the end, they are they are here not because they are nice. <laughs> they are here because they want to hire our students. So so they are they are putting their time together to get to get something. Okay, they 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 are they, they are for profit. Okay, they they, they know what they are doing. So a lot of people that are teaching, they are ranking our students to, to make offers. So first, we have all the large construction companies in the country hiring our students, uh, Kiwit, Bechtel, uh, Turner, and then the, the mid-sized uh, California companies, they're all around, all hiring our students. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the other areas, there are more, uh, more, uh, 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 transportation, obviously, that we have students working either for design companies, for consulting companies, or for uh, departments of transportation. Uh, uh, the environmental engineering students, too, they have many paths, many goals to work for uh, large engineering design companies, many goals to work for government agencies, many goals to work for nonprofit organizations. So uh, uh, there are uh, all possible types of jobs, so uh, so we don't have problem. Uh, historically, our students get multiple offers. Perfect. That's really great to hear. Um, also, another question from the audience is, 
Hi, I was wondering what is the Viterbi School looking for in terms of transportation engineering master's applicants? Um, so involvement in transportation engineering organizations, research experience, internships, or something else? Yeah, we, uh, we have a very good relationship with the local transportation organizations, and basically you have many of their people teaching our program, as I said before. So uh, they tend to mentor and host our students on those uh, transportation organizations. So as, as you could see, we take students that are really looking into engineering and optimization all the way to the students that want, that don't even have engineering degree, that wants to take the transportation management that's much more uh, related to policy and other things, uh, uh, getting more management jobs in transportation agencies or, or other organizations. So basically, it's all of the above. Okay, we have breath, and uh, we our students get uh, mentoring and and, uh, and and jobs in different uh, different spectrum of the whole transportation area, going from uh, uh, railroads to highways to uh, to ports, uh, airports. Or uh, we 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 cover all. Great. Awesome. And then, you know, what is there anything in particular you would be looking for um, in terms of applicants um, for that transportation engineering, aside from, you know, having the that, I, I think it's the same thing, okay? Uh, we look for intelligent students, okay? Uh, uh, the background uh, within engineering, everyone is qualified to take any of our masters, but we look for students that come with a good GPA from good schools. And uh, this is uh, what, what uh, this is the, basically the criteria. Uh, the GRE is not a part this year because of the pandemic and difficulty of taking the exam. So thank God, I didn't like the GRE. <laughs> the GRE uh, was something that people that are not taught, uh, not very very good, but would prepare for two three years would out. Uh, outperform someone that it's very good, but uh, just took the exam without uh, doing a lot of preparation. But again, uh, when you see at, uh, at uh, your uh, GPA and you know the quality of your school, and if you're a good student in your good school, we want you. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, are there opportunities for um, addressing the cost of graduate schools, such as TA ships or on-campus job opportunities as a, I believe, as a master's student? Uh, there is absolutely no TA ships for masters. It's uh, extremely, extremely rare because you have thousands of people applying for PhD and all the PhD students are funded. So you end up spending all the TA ships and RA ships with PhD students. What we have for master's students is normally not for the beginning, but for example, sometimes I have the master's students that wants to do research and I said voluntarily join my group. And after six months, I see that the student is completely outstanding. I don't want to lose that student by any cost. So, uh, so uh, I, I do find the fundings to, to move the students into the PhD program. Uh, uh, other opportunities that you have, we have uh, other positions in the department. This is not a full ride, but uh, it's very common for us to hire our own master's students to be graders. So, uh, so uh, they are paid per hourly to help the TA in grading exams and assignments. Uh, and, and and this is something that normally uh, sometimes happen when you have needs, but normally you take a class in your first semester, you do very well in the class, then the professor invites you to be the grader for the following semester. So these, these exist. And then, yeah, on campus there are, depending on the type of visa that you have, you can get some different jobs on campus. Perfect. Um, and I think this last, we're going to just have this oh, last question. Oh, and by question. the way, oh. 
one th uh, thing about TA, except TA in engineering, you have uh, sometimes master students in our department getting TA ships in, 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 in the department of physics, in the department of math. So those departments have to teach a very large number of students because we don't teach calculus only uh, in the department. We don't teach phys at the beginning physics, the freshman physics, the freshman math classes. They're all taught by by darn size uh, uh, through uh, through uh, uh, the service, the math department basically serve engineering teaching those classes. So they teach all their students, but they teach all the engineering students. So they they have a, a large volume. USC has a small class uh, sizes, so they have to have many. Uh, offerings of the class, so they need a lot of TAs, and sometimes they hire our students as TAs. Perfect, great. So I think the last question, and I think we'll wrap it up, would be, you know, so I'm decided between undecided between a master's and PhD program. Uh, would you recommend starting a master's degree before pursuing a PhD? Uh, uh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, uh, obviously, that as I said, every PhD student is funded, so uh, uh, funding is a blessing. Okay, uh, you would save a lot of money. Not just funded, you you have a stipend as a PhD student. But the PhD, it's much more difficult to be admitted because at the PhD, it's not just the fact of you being outstanding and a good student. It's a matching of availability of funds. So sometimes I have 30, 40 outstanding people applying to do PhD with me, but I, I have a grant to bring one. So basically, PhD students have a very small number of fellowships that the university offers, and the large majority of the PhD students come as, as you call RAs, research assistants. And who pays for it? It's me with my grants. Each professor, I write a proposal to National Science Foundation to develop a new AI tool to support robotics in construction. And now they give me the money, and now I have to hire a student to work with me in that project. So if I have a project and I have money, I bring the students. Some years, uh, 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 we, I don't get new projects. So even if I have an outstanding candidate, I cannot admit them because I don't have a way to fund them. So it's much more difficult to be admitted for a PhD because it's not just your quality, it's the availability of funds too. In a master's, if you are outstanding, if you're good, you would be admitted. It's, 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 uh, you are above the bar, you have the quality, we think that you're going to be a good student, you are admitted. So a lot of people start as a master's student, start interacting with professors for research, find their passion for research, and then uh, they try to move it, it later, okay? Uh, but uh, right. it's a difficult answer. It's a very difficult answer. It's very personal because it's very different. A master is very professional. A PhD, it's really to prepare to be a professor, prepare to be a researcher in the top research institution. So you have to find your passion. Doing a PhD, if you don't like to, to do research, would be very painful. Right. Well, that was a fantastic answer to a very challenging question. Uh, but thank you so much, Professor Soibelman, for answering all the questions, um, for providing such great insight into all of our civil environmental engineering programs. Um, I do know that we're wrapping up the session, but for all of you, those that joined us today, thank you so much for all your questions. If they are the more personalized questions, we will be able to answer those um, at this time, or also we can um, please encourage you, we do encourage you to email us. For our on-campus um, prospective students, please email viterbi.gradadmission at usc.edu. And for our online Den of Viterbi applicants, we do encourage you to email us at denoviterbi.usc.edu um, to ask your questions or set up a time to ch chat over the phone. But thank you all again so much. Of course, thank you again, Dr. Soibelman. Yeah. Just one, one final comment. I saw there were several answer, questions not answered. So I would recommend you, if you want, to send emails. 
Even someone that would be better to answer those questions than me, it's Christine Tia. She is the director of the graduate programs in the department. She can provide you those questions about what's the difference from water to the environmental water, engineering water. She can explain. I saw that there was a question, but it looks like we have no time to cover all the questions. So feel free to send me an email. I can answer or I can forward you to Christine, and uh, we will provide you answers to all your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Rebelman. That's really helpful. All right. Well, thank you all, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Enjoy uh, this Friday and the rest of your weekend. And as we see at USC, fight on. Bye, everyone.